Cyclops flying boat. Wing spread, 200 feet. Height, almost 45 feet. Largest yet in operation. At Baltimore, the first of a fleet of 20, the Hawaii Mars is ready for flight. 19 others, named after Pacific Islands, will join her in the Naval Air Transport Service. Down to the water for a takeoff. The Mars is more than 120 feet long and weighs 72 and a half tons. horsepower takes the giant plane smoothly to the air. The size of a 15-room house with two decks and sleeping accommodations for 36, the Mars can fly to Europe and back non-stop. Till total victory, she will speed fighting men and supplies throughout the vast Pacific battlefront. Just south of Japan, landing barges of the 2nd Marine Division plow toward Aiea Island, 25 miles from Okinawa. Here and on nearby Aguni Island, landings are unopposed. The only Japanese in evidence are civilian islanders. They come out of hiding places. Undefended Aiea and Aguni, there was no combat, but the misery and terror left behind by the enemy are not quickly overcome. On Okinawa itself, the last pitched battles are over, but a few die-hard enemy snipers must be cleaned out of this key island of the Ryukyu group. Grenades bring a Japanese out of the brush. And there is one less of the enemy to destroy. Flame-throwing tanks of the 1st and 6th Marine Divisions turn their fire on cane fields in the southern tip of Okinawa, where a small center of resistance remains. Increasing numbers of the enemy surrender. News of American treatment of prisoners has spread, and now the Japanese come in in larger groups. Stripped to prevent concealment of weapons, they are brought to internment areas. Japanese prisoners were once scarce, but on Okinawa, stepping stone to the homeland, many thousands are taken. Checked into the compound, Japanese are given food, shelter, and civilized care. Tokyo's official propaganda against surrender begins to lose effect even on Japanese soldiers themselves as the United States wins victory in the Ryukyus. Augusta, President Harry S. Truman ends an eight-day Atlantic crossing at the restored great port of Antwerp, Belgium. First stage of his mission to Berlin. United States Ambassador Sawyer, General Eisenhower, and Admiral Stark come up the Augustus gangplank to greet Mr. Truman. Secretary of State Burns are the President's chief traveling companions. Mr. Truman leaves his ship, 
to set foot on European soil. Driven to Brussels airport, President Truman takes up his trip by air. He boards the presidential plane for the flight direct to Berlin and the three-power conference with Generalissimo Stalin and Prime Minister Churchill. party arrives at Berlin. Secretary of War Stimson, Secretary Burns, warmly greeted by Ambassador Gromyko. The American president comes to Germany. An army convoy takes the president from the airport for a brief tour of shattered Berlin. Harry Truman sees with his own eyes the destruction brought upon the once arrogant capital of Germany. An object lesson to aggressors of the future, taught by united free men. Winston Churchill is Truman's first caller at United States headquarters in Potsdam. And Joseph Stalin meets the new American member of an historic triumvirate for the first time. Here, where German Kaisers first plotted world domination, Britons, Russians, and Americans meet after crushing those ambitions. They face far-reaching decisions. As was Franklin Roosevelt before him, Mr. Truman is named chairman of the conference. Important problems resulting from final victory in Europe and organization of the post-war world are the vital questions before the conference. During a respite from conference duties, Commander-in-Chief Truman inspects the United States 2nd Armored Division lined up on an autobahn outside Berlin. Just one of many mighty United Nations combat units that brought Germany to defeat. At a flag-raising ceremony in American-occupied Berlin, Mr. Truman speaks. We're here today to raise the flag of victory over the capital of our greatest adversary. In doing that, we must remember that in raising that flag, we are raising it in the name of the people of the United States who are looking forward to a better world, a peaceful world, a world in which all the people will have an opportunity to enjoy the good things of life and not just a few at the top. We want to see the time come when we can do the things in peace that we have been able to do in war. If we can put this tremendous machine of ours, which has made this victory possible, to work for peace, we can look forward to the greatest age in the history of mankind. That's what we propose to do.